I want to give you a preview of what's coming up. This is kind of an advertisement. We've worked hard on the season of Lent. We're doing some more things, more planning yet to come. Lent begins on the Wednesday before the service on February the 22nd. And one of the things we're going to ask you to do in the season of Lent, we want this to be interactive. The sermon series is going to be called Journey to the Cross. And Alice McKenzie and I are going to be preaching entirely out of the Gospel of Mark. We're actually going to be doing that in a chronological way. What we want to challenge you to do is to read the Gospel of Mark. Now, Mark is 15 chapters long, I think, 15, 16 chapters maybe. You can, it's about the size, the length of a typical chapter in a novel. So you can sit down and read the Gospel of Mark easily in one setting. We don't care how you read it, we just want you uh, to read it. You can read it a few verses with 15 chapters, 40 days in the season of Lent. You've got plenty of time to read it, reread it, maybe go to Matthew and Luke. Uh, Mark is the oldest gospel, it is the shortest gospel, and here's a little hint for you, and this is why I think it's important to start with Mark. When Matthew and Luke wrote their gospels, Guess what? They had Mark in front of them. So you'll see Mark in Matthew and Luke. It's kind of the, it's not exactly a cliff note, but it's kind of the fundamental, it's the uh, basis of Matthew and Luke in lots of different ways. So we want you to read through this. We will be preaching chronologically, picking out major stories chronologically uh, about the life of Jesus during the season of Lent, and you'll be able to kind of work on those stories with us, and then read the stories in between. I think this will really make a difference. Our Wednesday nights in Lent are going to be different, and I'm looking forward to sharing those with you as well. This morning I'm reading from Acts, the second chapter. This is uh, a story of what happened right after the moment of Pentecost, when the church was born. Peter has been preaching, and so we pick this story up in the 41st verse. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added to the church. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A number of years ago, I was trying to figure out how long ago this happened, and I couldn't. I'm guessing maybe 15 years or more ago. We had a staff member, a young mother. Um, I don't even remember what she did on the staff, but this incident is uh, burned into my memory. She had a four-year-old daughter at home who went upstairs, two-story home, and somehow this little girl managed to open her window and push against the screen and fall out of that second floor window onto the ground. Paramedics were called, the ambulances came. When they got there, they assessed the situation and deemed it to be a dire emergency. They loaded the little girl up, put her in an ambulance, and went straight down uh, to Children's Hospital in downtown Dallas. When we got the word here at Christ Church, I think we were in a staff meeting, and immediately we dispatched two staff members to go down there and be with her and members of the family. When they got there, they discovered in the emergency room that the members of this family were already surrounded by about half the members of their Sunday school class. Now, there's two ways to interpret that. One is a failure of the staff. We were late getting there. (laughs) The truth is we were there as soon as we could get there. The correct way to interpret this is that it was one of the really great moments in the history of Christ Church. We've had a lot of great moments here at Christ Church over the last 30 or 40 years. We've relocated the church. We've built some great buildings. We've burned some notes. More importantly, we've had Hotel Katrina where we really learned a lot about what it means to serve the community. 
We created Project Hope, still a life-changing, life-transforming ministry in our community. We've been, built 10 houses on the corner. I could go on and on down the list. But this always stands in my mind as one of the most triumphant moments in the life of our church because it was here that we saw clearly that we had in fact replicated what it means to be the church by the terms of the New Testament. And that's what we've always wanted to be, to be like the New Testament church, a people gathered in the name of Christ caring for one another. This passage from the second chapter of Acts is an important passage. It's, it's a well-known passage, certainly among scholars. It is a unique passage because really it's the only place that describes to us exactly what the early church looked like. And when you read it, it just seems to make so much sense. What the people in the early church were doing was so intuitive. It's are the th kinds of things that you and I do this day. Once they had discovered the love of God, once they had experienced the grace of God in their lives, they first of all, they came together to praise and worship God. Then they shared their money with one another so that they could take care of people less fortunate than they. And we're told on more than one occasion that they sat at the table together and broke bread with one another, blessed by the presence of of Christ. The story is 2,000 years old and yet it really is still the very best description today of what the church is at its best. The New Testament term, the Greek term is koinonia. Koinonia, it means the special kind of fellowship that takes place in the life of the church when Christ is present. It is different it is different from the kind of fellowship that we have when the neighbors get together or when we have a foursome uh, playing golf or there's the babysitting uh, neighborhood club. It is the special fellowship koinonia created by people who are joined together by the grace of Jesus Christ. We, we follow the trends in our culture pretty carefully up here. I mean, after all, we as a church sit in the midst of a great secular culture and it's important to understand it. And so we read the same things that you read in terms of how people feel about the church these days. And of course, the Pew Research Firm, they're kind of the gold standard in terms of helping us to understand how Americans think about a wide variety of issues these days, but especially about religion. And as you know, more and more people these days identify themselves as the nuns. In other words, they're not Methodist, they're not Baptist, they're not Catholic, they're not Jewish, they're not, even, they're not Muslim, they're just a nun. They don't identify with any particular form of organized religion. And when you drill down into that, you'll hear a lot of people identify themselves, and the Pew Research is, is pretty clear. Most people still believe in God. It's just that they've walked away. They've walked away from organized religion. And so the way a lot of people describe themselves these days is spiritual, but not religious. Spiritual, but not religious. Well, a couple of things about that. First of all, in terms of a little bit of a rebellion against institutional religion, I get that. The sins of the church are many, and we, and we understand that. We can always do better. But if one really means spiritual but not religious, as if you can go it alone in terms of your spirituality, that you can believe in God and just do it by yourselves, let me say to you that spirituality in the Christian tradition, spirituality in the Christian tradition cannot be done as a solo. You can't do it by yourself. One of the ways to understand this, I think, is to simply look at the life of Jesus. Jesus it's such a powerful example, and we'll be talking about this through the season of Lent. 
time alone spent with God, we see that it's a powerful example in the Gospels. Jesus setting himself aside. And we're told on numerous occasions in the New Testament that he went out to be alone, to be in silence, to pray to God in silence. He didn't want anybody around him. And in my opinion, that is absolutely necessary for the spiritual life, to have time apart with God, silent, the power of silence. And yet every time we read that about Jesus, we read him rising from prayer and saying to the disciples, come on, let's get back to work. There are people we came to see. There are people whose lives make a difference. Ultimately, Jesus called us into communion, into fellowship, called us into the life of the church. And so no matter how you practice your religion and hopefully hopefully practice your spirituality and hopefully all of us spend some time alone with God, ultimately, ultimately, spirituality is not a solo experience. Once somebody knows the power of God's grace and God's love in their lives. They're called to be with one another. A couple of days ago, I did something interesting. You might try this. I went to uh, an online Bible and I did a search for the word table. I didn't count how many times it came up, but at least maybe a dozen or a couple of dozen times in the New Testament, and I just kind of surveyed down there through the lines. The word table appears a lot in the New Testament because Jesus used it a lot, and Jesus was sitting at the table a lot. He went to the taxpayers and sinners. He said, let's have a banquet. Let's sit at the table. He once described the kingdom of God as a table, as a feast. When we get to the kingdom of God, we'll all be sitting there at the table enjoying the feast together. It is what I call the power of the table. When we come together and invite Jesus to be with us. This morning, we're doing a kind of a half turn away from our January sermon series, which was called Be Not Afraid, Living Peacefully in a Frightening World. And I say a half turn because I want to point out to you that one of the, one of the opportunities that we have in the life of the church in terms of living peacefully is this opportunity for communion, for koinonia, for fellowship blessed by Christ. And I'll just put it succinctly. We are stronger together than we are alone. And we live more peacefully together than we do alone. If you've been, if you've been present in this room over the last several months on a fairly consistent basis, you've heard me refer to this so many times. But I think this is something that is worthy of redundancy. It's this image that we have when we pray the Lord's Prayer. When we get to that powerful line, give us this day our daily bread. And I encourage you again that when you pray that prayer, give us this day our daily bread, that you think about this image sitting at the table in communion with friends and loved ones and maybe some others who Jesus has invited to be at your table. And praying with intentionality, give us this day our daily bread, the physical sustenance, the emotional and mental food that I need for this day, the spiritual sustenance that I need this day. Give us this day our daily bread so that we will be ready to meet the obstacles and the challenges and the opportunities which lie in front of me this day. I don't know that there's any one spiritual practice that you could do on a daily basis that would be more powerful than that, starting your day, sitting at the table with Jesus, saying, give us this day all that we need. In the life of the church, spirituality can't be done on its own. And aren't we grateful for that? Dr. Fred Craddock 
probably about 90 years old now. He's retired. He still does a speaking engagement here and there for my money. He's as good a preacher as I've ever heard in my lifetime. He's a Disciples of Christ preacher. I heard him preach a sermon one time in which he told about growing up in the hills of eastern Tennessee. His mother was a devoted church woman, and she took him to church every single Sunday, Sunday school and worship. His father was not an atheist. He was not a skeptic, but he didn't believe in the church. And Dr. Craddock said, I can remember growing up We'd have these revivals in our little town. They'd have an evangelist come in and preach and have a revival. And they would always haul the evangelist out to my home to meet with my father. Try to get him to come to church. Two or three times during the year, the pastor or one of the members of the men's group would come out. Try to get my father to come to the church. My father was absolutely stubborn on this. He said, all they want to do is just add my name to the rose. That's all they want. All they want is my money. All those years, he refused to join the church. When his father lay dying in the hospital, he had a cancer that had metastasized from his lungs up to his larynx. He couldn't talk anymore. He was in his final days. And Dr. Craddock tells about going to the hospital to visit him. He said he walked into the hospital room. His father was there in bed, couldn't speak, but very cogent. And he went over and he sat down. And he noticed a, a, a pile of cards on the little table there by the bed. He didn't know whether his father had, had read the cards or not. So he picked them up and he started reading them one at a time. The first one said, Mr. Craddock, we want you to know that we are praying for you. It was signed by the men's Bible group at the church. And he put it down. He picked up a second one. We want you to know that we're praying for you and that we're, we're, we're delivering meals to Mrs. Craddock and we're here to support you in whatever way we possibly can. Signed, the women's circle at the church. He picked up a little one, a church, one that was written in, in block letters that said, Dear Mr. Craddock, we hope you get well soon. It was the children's Sunday school class at the church. He went on and read them one at a time. When he got to the last one, he set it down. His father motioned for the pad of paper and the pencil that was sitting on that tray. And he handed it to him and he scribbled out these words. It was a line from Shakespeare. In this harsh world, draw your breath with pain when you tell my story. I was wrong. I was wrong. There's nothing we have that we should value more in the life of this church than the power of the table. People who have discovered the love of God in their lives and who have discovered the power of sharing it with one another. Sitting with those who experience and share the grace and love of God. Coming to the table where Jesus sits with us. This morning, the table is open. Each one of you is invited.